Hey, I'm Alex Radko from Board Game Co. And this is another Games Leaving the Collection video, this time for October. That's not true, for September. This time for September, I got it right. It's early enough in the video I could restart, but I'm not going to. Let's go ahead and charge confidently forward. So, if you're new to the channel, this is going to be the video series in which I talk about the various games leaving my collection. I always am playing new games and rotating games into the collection, and that means games need to leave. And if you watched my video last month, you already know that things are getting harder and harder to actually get rid of anything. There are too many, there are too many good gaming experiences I've been having in the past year and a half, in the past, in the, in the past while. There are too many good games being added to my collection, and I really desperately try to find things. I did sort of manage to find 10 games. This, usually I just aim for 10. That's the number I aim for. If I, if I happen to have more, great, but I usually just aim for 10, but, and if you're asking why I'm trying to get rid of games, why not just have them all? It's because the reality is you need to actually get rid of things if you're getting things in. I don't have magically more time to play all these. Sure, I can find the space, but that's not the point. As long as I'm getting things in and I don't want to stop getting things in, then I have to acknowledge that there is a rotation, there is a circle of life, and that means I do have to look around the shelves and see what I'm actually realistically going to table and what I'm not, because there's just something better that I'd rather play in that time. And that's that's why we have these games. That said, while I did technically manage to find 10, I am scraping the bottom of the barrel here, and I'm even cheating a little bit. Number one, the one I'm cheating with is going to be the Commandos. And I'm not getting rid of the Commandos. Not really. A, it's a long, complicated story, but I'm not actually... Well, it's not actually that long. <laughs> it's not long or complicated. I'm just going to tell you the story. The very short version of V Commandos is V Commandos is an excellent game, and I may actually get rid of this at some point. Uh, in short, vers the short version of this is V Commandos is since been renamed to V Sabotage. Not as good a name, but they had to rename it for licensing issues or whatever it is. But it's also going to be... It's going to have a lot of the same uh, commonalities as Assassin's Creed, which Assassin's Creed is an excellent game. Assassin's Creed, in fact, is a game that I think is better than V Commandos, with the caveat that I'm not comparing it to the other content of V Commandos, I'm comparing it base to base. If I'm comparing it the all the base of Assassin's Creed and the base to V Commandos, I prefer Assassin's Creed. With the caveat that it's also a, a campaign game, which means Assassin's Creed is harder to table. I am not, almost certainly not, going to be keeping Assassin's Creed and V Commandos in my collection. But I haven't yet decided which one I am. They recently had a, a Kickstarter campaign for V Commandos Ghost. As someone who only owns the base game for V Commandos, I just went ahead and went all in on the V Commandos Ghost campaign, getting everything, which means I know full well that I have a replacement base game, and I may as well get rid of this one before the other one hits, especially because currently if I'm playing something, I'm playing Assassin's Creed up on the shelf you can, out of camera, you can't see it there. Either way, my point is, this may one day leave, or Assassin's Creed may one day leave, or maybe both will leave, I don't know, but for sure, almost for sure one of them's going to leave, but today, I'm just, I'm just cheating. This is, this is going away, but V Commandos is definitely coming back. From there, we go into actual ones. Now, I will say, if you're one of those people who looks at the timestamps, there is one on this list which is really, it hurt to get rid of, it did hurt, but, We'll save that for last. Let's go through the ones that are significantly easier, although I don't think any, no, that's not true, one of these games was easy. Let's cover the easiest game on this list, and then everything else will just explain why they were harder games to get rid of. And the easiest game on this list for me is going to be Port Royal. Port Royal, a game by Alexander Pfister that I had the chance to play, I did not like it. I did not like it, Sam I Am. I did not like Green Eggs and Ham. I did not like to play Port Royal. It wasn't a game that I enjoyed. I didn't have a good rhyme. I was hoping I'd rhyme that, but I didn't have a good rhyme. I did not like Port Royal. I do not... I mean, so th this is... Fun fact. Uh, I basically, on a recent Q&A with, uh, with uh, Mike Delucio from the Dice Tower, I asked, what are some good, cheap games that you recommend? Not necessarily for me. I just... It was a topical conversation talking about expensive games. I was like, what are two good games under $35? And he recommended Port Royal and Oh My Goods. And I was like, I own both of those. Let me actually finally play them. I've read the rules for Oh My Goods. I haven't yet tabled it. I read the rules for Port Royal and tabled it. Mike, I like you, man. In fact, from all the people in the Dice Tower since Sam Healy left... I think my tastes most align with Mike, with you, Mike, just in case you're watching this, in case. But either way, I did not like Port Royal, unfortunately. So Port Royal is a game which you're basically going to be trying to gather, you're, you're, you're trying to get as many points as possible by going on expeditions or, or gathering various cards and whatnot. It, it felt like a push-your-luck game that wasn't fun, felt totally luck-based, and didn't have moments that felt rewarding. 
I really didn't like Port Royal. Like, if I were rating games, I mean, I don't often rate games that I... I mean, it will have a rating in my own list somewhere, but this would be a 2 for me. It's a 2 based on a single play, so take it with a grain of salt. Not a game for me. This is the only easy pick on the list, assuming you don't count the one where I'm cheating. But yeah, Port Royal, Alexander Fister, not a game for me. He's an amazing designer, a lot of games of his that I do enjoy, and a lot of games that I plan on diving into, but, but not Port Royal. I'm sorry for spending so much time on this one. It's just, it's... I actually don't like this one compared to the rest of this list, which I do like in one shape or form or another. Not entirely true. Let's go with the second easiest pick on this list. The second easiest pick on this list. I should look actually at all the titles before I say stuff. Kabuto Sumo. Kabuto Sumo is an, another easy-ish pick. Not as easy as Port Royal. You see, Kabuto Sumo is one that I am getting rid of, but I actually sort of want to keep it. If you watched my recent review of Kabuto Sumo, I did give it a 2, but it was a 2 based on the caveat uh, that based on the way the game is meant to be played, it's a 2, but we could potentially house rule a few different things. And I know from speaking to other people as well, I've seen a variety of house rules that would all tentatively improve the experiment. Kabuto Sumo is going to be a game which you're trying to push off your opponent's wrestler off the, the board, and so you're trying to like push on your, your, your token you think of the coin games in arcades, you push on a token, other things fall off, you use the things that fall off to continue to push it. Uh, we had some house rule ideas of our own to potentially apply. I've talked to other people who have other house rules of they push it further onto the middle of the board, different things, a whole bunch of different options in terms of the, the concept of the game is solid, the concept is great, the art is great, the abilities are great, the implementation ends up being a little slow, and so there's a bunch of potential house rules at play. But I don't know if I'm excited enough to try them. Meaning those house rules could potentially all move this game to a 3 for me, as opposed to a 2. But, I checked with my daughter as well, who I reviewed this with Ricky, she gave it a 3 out of 5. I checked with her before getting rid of it, she's like, yeah, it's okay, you can get rid of it. It's a good, it's a good game. I, I think it's a good game, but that's, that's where, that's not true, I shouldn't say that. For me, it's a great concept with potential house rules that turn it into a good game. But it's not one that I'm definitely craving. It's one that may well be a good fit for you. I know a lot of people have been enjoying it. It's well rated. It's one of the board game table's higher rated board games. For myself, I have other board game table games that I enjoy a lot more that I should really, I should really do some more content on some of the games I do enjoy from board game tables. I've already done some reviews of them. Either way, not the point. Kabuto Sumo is a game that is unfortunately in my collection. It's a game that I kind of want to keep, but when I'm looking around trying to get rid of things, it's definitely an easier one to pick. Next up, we move to the ones that start getting a little harder. Every other game I would like to have kept more so. Again, even Kabuto Sumo I kind of would like to keep in theory if given infinite time and all that. But Sheepy Time from AEG is going to be leaving the collection. This is another one that we rated this uh, month. Uh, my daughter, I think she gave it a 4. I gave it a 3, but whatever. I don't remember she gave it. Maybe it was a 4, I don't remember. Whatever it was, she was fine getting rid of it when she saw it in the pile. Whenever I get rid of kids' games, I run them by the kids, and she was she was totally fine with it. She was it's a good game. Sheepy Time is a good game. In fact, I would argue more than that. I want to keep Sheepy Time. I think Sheepy Time is a fun experience. It's a push your luck game of trying to avoid the nightmares, and the further you can push, basically, the more sleepy points you'll get, and the further ahead you'll get. It's a it's a little fun little how far can you go before the nightmare catches up to you, just like in real life, honestly. But where Sheepy Time falls apart for me is in the genre of push your luck kids games, there are other games that we prefer to play. And so it's not that Shippy Time is bad, it's that for me it's solid three, but there are other games I'd rather play. Even just Can't Stop, the classic push your luck game, is a game that my kids love playing. It doesn't have the abilities of Shippy Time. It doesn't. Shippy Time does have a whole bunch of abilities that potentially it could potentially can make it a better game. The actual implementation has me preferring to play other other push your luck games with my kids, from Captain Cutlass, Captain Carcass, depending on the name, the version, to from Dead Man's Draw is the other name of that game. From Can't Stop, from I have to look at my shelves, but there are other push your luck games that I enjoy playing with my children, that Sheepy Time, while being good, is not one that I am keeping in my collection. Next up, let's go with another easier one, which is Talder Viking. Talder Viking is a game from Haba, and I think it's, um, I don't know what the English, Valley of the Vikings, there we go, it says it on a little fine print. Valley of the Vikings from Haba is a solid, enjoyable game that I would give a 3 out of 5, eh, it's hard to, sometimes it's hard to rate kid games. Especially Haba games. Some of the Haba games that are focused more on younger kids. This might be a 2 out of 5 for me, in terms of my own personal preference of diving into it. But as far as a quick, simple game, which you basically are bowling. You're rolling a little bowling ball into the middle of the table, knocking things over, while trying to advance on this track. It's a cute game. Uh, like many Haba games, this box is like, the tops are falling off. Like many Haba games, it is a great implementation, a great game to introduce kids to more mechanics, to more concepts, while having some fun wrapped into it. It's a game that I easily recommend as being enjoyable, but 
again, in the picture of, for real context, what happened here with this one is, I didn't even choose this one for this week. What happened is there was another game on the pile that Ricky did want to save. And I said, hey, do you have any suggestions to replace it? And she's like, ah, well, we don't put, we don't play Tile of the Vikings. We like it, but nobody ever asks to play it. And so this one is uh, on the hit list, unfortunately. A good game, like many Haba games. Haba games are interesting. I, I try, I generally try to try as many Haba games as possible. Some of them stay in my collection. Some of them go away. So it's an interesting balance of, yay, we got another Haba game to try, and we enjoyed it. And some are, like Rhino Hero, we still have. Um, there's another, like, Glitter something, the, the Glitter cloud one we still have we should probably get rid of that one we haven't played in a long time either way we have a lot of hobby games they stay for various points of time and some have stayed for a very long time most eventually do leave especially as my kids are getting older and many of the ones that are more catered towards younger ages they are slowly growing out of next up we have renature renature from capstone games which is a game that i really enjoyed my first play of renature and my second play felt exactly like my first play, and my third play felt exactly like my second play, and that's where I was kind of done with Renature. Renature is a game that is a domino-based game where you have different animals that are basically replacing the uh, the animals, uh, you know, matching the various sides. So like the slug goes next to the slug, the bat goes next to the bat. I don't actually know if there's a slug, but whatever the animals are, the owls, the bats, the different animals they have in the game, they all go next to one another as you try to balance a bit of area control with domino placement. So it's a little bit of area control as you try to close off and encircle things while putting different trees in. It. For me, Renature ends up being a mix of mechanics that don't feel like they go well together. The, the sheer luck of the domino placement kind of often forces you into positioning, which means the real game is you're forced into moves that may or may not work well for you, but they are it is what it is, for the most part. There are exceptions and there's some mitigation, but for the most part, it often feels like you're just kind of forced into where you go. And the decision space is around which tree you plant in that area to kind of mess with people and knock them out. For myself, I like the area control aspect. I like the messing with people and knocking them out. I'd rather just play Las Vegas. It feels very much like We Nature is a attempting to be a more strategic version of what the experience that I get from Las Vegas of trying to compete for different casinos and the middle people will get completely eliminated and then the top and bottom, whatever it is. It's a it's an interesting mechanism. It works far better for me in Las Vegas where you're going to have just more of a party feel to the game and the experience as opposed to in We Nature where it feels like it's trying to be more strategic but isn't. I enjoy this one. This would be a strong, like, again, if I were rating games, this would be a 3, uh, arguably a 3.5, but when I'm in the middle, I just still pick a number. And it would it would be a 3, that 3.5 that goes down to a 3 as opposed to going up to a 4. So it's a 3.4. Let's call it a 3.4. I do enjoy it, but not enough to keep it when I'm trying to find things to cull. Next up, and these were the, these were the easiest ones. Again, none of these were actually easy past Port Royal. Kibbutzuma was a little easy, but I kind of wish I could keep it and play it. But the only one I really genuinely have no interest in is Port Royal. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Alexander Fister. I, I don't mean to be so harsh. I'm just my point is these are all good games. I'm just constantly having to choose not the good games, but okay. From here is where it gets a little harder. Should we go with old ones or the new ones? Let's go with old ones. I'm going to talk about the old ones here. So starting off with Brave Rats. Brave Rats, small container that it is, this is not freeing up space on my shelves, to be very clear, I got rid of 10 games, congratulations. I also got a giant box of Ignite, which is like, you know, this and this and this, like a full Kylex cubby of Ignite, and I'm getting rid of Brave Rats, so yay, one in, one out, that's gonna work out well for me over time. It, Brave Rats is a delightful game. I love Brave Rats. I easily recommend this game. This is a strong four for me, a strong four, a light little puzzle. Like, I, I, there's a game, uh, what's called Love Letter, is a very common game. And to me, Brave Rats is a better, I, I never liked Love Letter, but I love Brave Rats as you go through these different cards. Every player has their own exact set of cards that they're going to be playing with. And then you're picking a card to play down and matching them up against one another and then seeing who won. But the abilities and the little bit of a mind game as you play and think through well, you're going to play that, so I'll play this. And then once the cards start to come down, it's Mind Games Plus information. A lot of fun. I really like Brave Rats. I think it's a great game. I recommend it. I've also had this game for like five or six years, and there's only seven cards. Well, seven times two, 14 cards. So, But the point is, each player only has seven cards. So there's seven abilities in this game. And I've been playing this game consistently as a filler for the past five, six years, however long I've had this. And when I say consistently, there's been a drop-off. I play this less and less as the years go by because the puzzle is boring to me now. The puzzle was immensely interesting, and it's a great game. I recommend this. I genuinely, Blue Orange Games, solid game. Pick this one up. Seriously, by all means, like, pick this one up. In fact, in fact, let's do better than that. Uh, if you want Brave Rats, literally just use the word Brave Rats in a comment somewhere in this video, 
and I'll pick a winner and ship it. The US only, because I mean, it'll cost me like five bucks to ship this. I don't really care. But if I go international, it'll cost me like 30 bucks to ship it. And then I, I do care. But US only, if you throw the word brave rats in the comments, I'm going to send this to you because I want someone else to enjoy this game. I want someone else to enjoy this game. A sleeve, by the way, in case it matters. But it's a good game. I just, I've played it out, and I don't think I realized I played it out until there's really, smaller games on my shelf generally, uh, they get more excuses to stay, because I'm like, it's not even clearing up shelf space, like, who cares, I'll keep it for that one time I want to play it, and so I think I overlooked it in the past several calls, because it's a small game, but I really don't pull it out anymore, because I like it, but I've played out the puzzle. And in the exact same note of everything else I just said, we have Hey That's My Fish. Exact same logic, exact same reasoning, exact same problem. A game that plays two to four players, although I recommend this only at two players, like genuinely only at two players, is how I would play Hey That's My Fish. Because as a two-player game, what happens in Hey That's My Fish is you're 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 intensely competing on the strategic abstract game of cutthroat decisions. This looks like a kid's cartoon game. This is a game of cutthroat decisions as you slowly close off the ice. Every single turn you move a penguin and then eat the tile the penguin is on, which results in the tiles slowly decreasing. And at first glance, you think it's about trying to get the three fish tile, get the two fish tile, because the one fish tile is only one point. But that's not what the game is. The game is about finding ways to cut off your opponents, to lock them in place, to seclude them on their own little tiny island so you can go marching around eating all the fish you want. It is cutthroat, it is mean, it is beautiful. Introduce a third player and suddenly you have the randomness of, okay, great, so you messed up my move. It's no longer a head-to-head -head battle of wits so much as it is a head-to-head -head battle of wits with a third person who will mess you up or some form of, you know, uh, king-making as players gang up. As a two-player com cutthroat competitive game, it is very, very good. There's also no powers and abilities, there's no variability, it's the exact same game every single time. And like Brave Rats, I've had this game for 5-6 years, I've had it for a long time, I've recommended it for a long time. It is, I mean, I remember bringing this to my hospital when, bringing this to the hospital when we had, I want to say, our second child. And he's like 7, so like, my, wow, it's been a long time. We've had this game for a long time, it is a good game. But again, I stopped pulling it out. I stopped suggesting it. The only time games like Brave Rats and Hey That's My Fish end up showing up is when I'm trying to introduce a new person to games. And while that's nice, and while those still would serve that purpose, I have other games that I'd rather play that I could also introduce them to. There's always new games, so why not pick the thing that's new for me or still exciting for me while also being exciting for them, as opposed to just the thing that's exciting for them. Next up, second last, we have Fairy Tale in from Kaman. You see, I get rid of Kaman games from time to time, although I don't know if you necessarily count this as a typical Kaman game. Fairy Tale in is delightful. This was a hard pick. It really was a hard pick. It's, it's, this, again, no matter what I do, there are hard picks. And there are so many games that I looked around my shelf in terms of trying to find things that are, that I can get rid of. There are dozens and dozens of games I can pick and may one day pick if they continue to go unplayed. But as long as I think that I'm realistically playing the game, as long as I think there's a chance that it's going to be tabled, that I look at it and I'm like, well, I still would play that game, then it still stays around. I don't think Fairy Tale Inn is getting played. I really like it. It's really well done. It's a game of Connect 4, basically, except it's not actually Connect 4 in the slightest, but it has the, the little sliding, you know, you can see it over here, this thing over here that looks like Connect 4. And what's going on is you're going to have different abilities in play, and the abilities are going to basically choose, as you put down different tiles in different areas, it chooses how you score coins or score points or different things in the game. It's a light little puzzle that uses a Connect 4 mechanism to a degree. It really doesn't feel like Connect 4, though. But it takes that, it adds powers and abilities, it adds cute artwork, and it does a really good job of delivering a fun puzzle. And here's where this game loses it for me. For the first part is, as a two-player head-to-head game, there are many other choices I'd rather play. I like Fairy Tale Inn. This would be like a 3.5-ish rounded. It might. It's not a 4. It's not a 4. I can't give it a 4. It's a 3. It's still a 3. It's, it's a strong 3, but it's a 3. But it's a game that I'm going to pick other games when trying to go head-to-head -head against other people. I'm going to pick Santorini if I want something light and cartoony against head-to-head. -head. I'll pick Mythic Mischief. It'll, it's a little longer, but honestly, it's not that much. No, it's longer. It's longer. Fairy Tailing can be played in like 25 minutes. So yeah, Santorini would still be longer. I'll pick a bunch of other games that I enjoy more for a two-player head-to-head game, especially Adult Focus, which means the only way this had a chance of staying in my collection is if my daughter would be asking for it. If And she's specifically, specifically I'm saying my daughter because she's the only one who's played it for my kids, but if she would look at it and say, I want to play that with you, but she doesn't. 
there are other two-player games she prefers. She would rather play Jaipur with me, or a dozen other, you know, Patchwork, or any number of a bunch of other two-player head-to-head games. Harry Potter, Hogwarts Duel. Not necessarily the same genres of games, but she's picking different games when she chooses something head-to-head for me. And I would only play this with her, because against any of the, my adult two-player, my, my wife, my friends, whatever it is, I'd play something a little heavier. I like Fairy Tale Inn. I do recommend it. I think it's a solid game if your kids will, will, will latch onto it and enjoy the powers and abilities in the process, or even just lightweight and gateway gamer. It was a hard choice. I am sad to see it go because this, I think, is the game that I have, well, from the games I like, it's the one that I have the fewest plays of in my collection. I, I think I've only played this like two or three times. I enjoy it, but it's time to move on. And then lastly, lastly on this list, and like I said already, I there are no easy decisions. There are no easy decisions. There are there are a dozen titles that I looked at and debated. This is when you get called. This is when you move on from. I still have hope for some of them. I still have hope that they will get played more often. There are a lot of good games out there. And there are good games and there are better games. That's the problem. When I'm looking, a good example, I'll tell you one example. The Oracle of Delphi, which is still in my collection. I think it's Oracle of Delphi, whatever it is. Oracle of Delphi by Stefan Feld. And then there's Bruges by Stefan Feld. I'd rather play Bruges any day of the week. So will I keep the Oracle of Delphi? I don't know if I will. For right now, I still want to because I really like the Oracle of Delphi. If I were playing Bruges more, I'd want the Oracle of Delphi for that variability aspect. I'm just using two examples here, but there are other games as well that filter into the mix. But I'm looking at the Oracle of Delphi and I'm like, do I want to get rid of it? And I don't. I don't want to get rid of it. I really, really want to keep it. And that's true about a lot of games. But the one I actually chose to get rid of today is one that is a bit more of a commitment. And that's why I'm choosing to get rid of it. This whole suspense thing is kind of a waste of time when you actually include timestamps telling people what you're doing. But this one is heavy. And it's going to be Either Fields, which I just realized I showed you a black. There we go. Either Fields. Or, or better this way. Either Fields. Maybe that makes sense to you. This is Either Fields. Either Fields by, Taint, by Awaken Realms. And it's a game. My table is a heavy box. Chock full of cards. Either Fields is a game that I really don't want to get rid of. Let's just turn these over here. Gotta make it all pretty looking. I really don't want to get rid of either fields. I think either fields is... Am- Sorry, I'm just so distracted by making the boxes line up prettily for the camera. Either fields is a very good game. Uh, this one was would be a four to five for me. Like, I really, really enjoy either fields. It is complex. The rules are a mess. I talked about this. I did a full review of it. The rules are a mess. I acknowledge that. There are some aspects of the game, like the, the slumber sequences or whatever it is, are, are just repetitive to a degree, and they've introduced new rules to avoid those. But if you ignore those, if you're willing to house rule, and I am willing to house rule when it comes to cooperative games primarily, or solo games primarily, and I'm playing this game solo, I really like it past that. I really like the narrative. I really like the exploration. I really like how every single dream feels like its own little separate puzzle. Some aspects I don't really care about, Deck building in the game, I don't really care for. I'm not against it. I just don't care for it. It's not, I don't really strongly feel like I'm building a deck. For me, it's about the exploration, the action selection, the action allocation, whatever it is, trying to figure out where I can push, looking at the cards and trying to deduce and see different, like, possibilities. Like, oh, if I open that door, I can open that door, I can, or I can jump through that window. But if you look closely at the art, not just on your tiles, but on other tiles you've explored, there might be hints as to which one is a better use of your time. Either Fields is great. It's so much fun. But it's also a campaign game. And it's if I'm looking at the campaign games that I'm most willing to get rid of in my collection, it is going to be Either Fields. And I, when I did my review of this, I think I did a Play This Not That on Either Fields versus Isis Vanguard, and I was like, I think I'll finish both these campaigns. And I did genuinely think that I finished both these campaigns. And if I had more time, or if I wasn't really, if I wasn't more in a rush to get rid of everything, I think I would still finish Either Fields. I like the game. I like it a lot. It's a lot of fun to really go through each dream to discover how the nuance of the exploration of each one. But if I'm comparing it to other games, there are other games I'd rather play. I'd rather spend my time right now diving into Tainted Grail and seeing what that's all about. I've heard so many good things about it. I'd rather spend my time diving into ISS Vanguard when that comes out, or even the prototype that I still have to continue playing. I'd rather spend my time with Iridia, with Agamonio, the scare games that still give me story and narrative and, and these branching paths, open worlds, but with more gameplay mechanics that I like around it. As much as I like Either Fields, it is primarily story-driven. 
and as a primarily story driven experience, it means it is one of the first to go. Mechanically, I think the game is not as much what I'm looking for. ISS Vanguard also has the same problem, but that one gives me a ship phase that I think is a lot more fun to build out and develop your ship and to deal with the various emergencies that happen there. I like ISS Vanguard more for that reason. It's not that I don't like either fields. I really like either fields. And I recommend the game. Uh, a solid game, solid, enjoyable experience. You have to be comfortable with some of the house rules. You have to be comfortable with some of those things you have to deal with. But if you are, it's a really good experience. But in terms of the things that are filling up the boxes behind me on any the, the, the filling up the shelves behind me, filling up the shelves left, right, and center, there's too many good games and there's not enough time to play them all. And so that's it. These are the 10 games leaving the collection this month. Uh, one cheat. This is really just a cheat. This is Vic Manos and me just buying myself time. And then a whole bunch of games that I am reluctantly making the choices for. I think I freed up a good Calyx Cubby. Two Calyx Cubbies. I felt no, two and a half. I got two and a half Calyx Cubbies cleared up, which means that I'm good for like another day or two. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, have a good one. And then for all those who usually ask in the comments what I'm doing with the games, I usually sell or trade the games. I mean, Brave Rats, comment Brave Rats, and you'll get it. The rest of the games, I usually trade or sell them uh, very often. I actually have a video if you want to see how to get rid of your own games. I have a video I'll link. I generally link to it down below in the description for these types of videos, basically covering how you can sell a game, going through the process start to finish. It's usually pretty pretty easy. It's not it's not particularly complicated. It's not always worth it for something like Brave Rats. Like the work you have to put in to sell like a seven dollar game is not necessarily worth it. But as soon as you start moving up the chain, putting in a few minutes to sell a $20 game, a $30 game can very often be worth your time, especially if you're bundling things. It's a little bit of a side tangent and spoiler to the end of this video. Probably should have done it before I said, I'm Alex Radcliffe, have a good one. But then I remembered at the end and it was too late. I was like, well, I have a choice. I could just not say it or I can just pretend this is like an after secret video spoiler. So we'll do the latter. We'll pretend it's an after secret video spoiler. Anyways, thanks for watching and have a good one.